as we get uh, prepared here to, to teach, one kind of asked not to announce, and yet it needs to be announced, uh, and that is uh, Dane Liberty is going to have some surgery this week, and uh, the saints need to remember him and the whole family in prayer, and uh, we'll just leave it at that as that embarrasses them for me to say that, but uh, we, I encourage you to be an encouragement to them, and, and they are a real trophy of God's grace and peace working inside of a person, uh, Dane and his young life, and, and April and James and, and the rest of the kids as well. So remember them this week. Philippians chapter um, 2, we're ready to move on a different section. We've covered verses 5 through 8 where we called the, talked about the condensation of Christ, where he stooped down to become our Savior, leaving uh, the throne of God and the in the very form of God and coming down to earth and in the form of a man and then going and dying on a cross for our sins. But now we get to reverse that and realize that in verses 9 through 11 that God highly exalted him. I probably won't go through the list other than just read it today, but when we talked about the condescension of Christ, we saw that there were seven steps downward. And then in the exaltation of Christ, depending on how you would number them, but the way we're going to number them, You'll, you'll see seven steps of exaltation, and you'll see why we're breaking some of it up when you could actually lump a bunch together as we get into the details of each one. We'll barely cover the first one today. Uh, but let me read you the passage and then remind you of the lesson uh, that we're to learn from this uh, as we move on to then study verse 9. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Our Father, we do pray today that as we look at this passage and center in on your Son and, and his willingness to come and be our Savior and your exaltation of him and what pleases you and how ultimately all knees will bow and confess that he's Lord to your glory that, Father, we pray that uh, our hearts would already be bowed, that our, our lives would already be submitted to him. And we pray, Father, that, that these verses uh, would just, again, redirect us to not only the Lord and, and the exaltation of our Savior, uh, but also the mindset that you've asked us to have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the condensation of Christ, as he stooped down to become our Savior, verses 5 through 8 listed the things that he did. And I said last week, I said it at the beginning, said it at the end, said we had to go back there one more time before we leave that, that in Christ stooping down to become our Savior, all of that is being said in the sense of verse 5, to let that mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. And that mind that was in Christ Jesus, let me read the verses again, verse 6 through 8. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found as fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the mind that we're told to have, this mind of Christ, the mind of condensation, is a mind of humility, Self-humility, not someone humbling you, not you being humbled by, by some deed you've done or something, but it's, it's a self-humiliation, that you are to have a mind that's a mind of no reputation, a mind of a mind of a servant, a mind that is like-minded, that is the likeness, he came in the likeness of men, that Jesus Christ identified himself as oneness with man, sameness with man. And in, in, in your humility, if, in, in your mindset to have the mind of Christ, is to come and not come with a reputation that you think you need to uphold or be held up in reputation. 
that you come as a form of a servant. You come realizing you're just like everybody else. You're no different. But then Jesus Christ also had the mind to be obedient unto death. Obedience unto God. And while we might be one with like-minded one with another, at the same time our obedience is toward God. And then ultimately he became a self-sacrifice for the benefit of others. And that's the mindset that we are told to have. And I remind you, we're told to have that mindset because of what he taught out of verses 1 through 4. Look at those verses. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. All that's described as, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that the, the, when we talked about Jesus Christ and what he did, naturally we focus in on him and the cross work of Christ, but the practical application, if he did that for us, <laughs> what, what, that's not even a step of humility to have that same attitude toward a brother in Christ. It, you know, the things that divide a local assembly, uh, they're extremely petty. When divisions take place, now there is place where separation is taught in the Bible, and sometimes you have to do a biblical separation, but almost 90% of the time when there's divisions in the church, Paul says there's carnality. He says when there is division, it is carnality. And it's amazing how, how pitiful the, the reasons that people separate. And whatever comes your way, you get insulted, something happens your way, you're being told in this passage of Scripture to have this condescending mind thought of someone destroyed your reputation. Well, you're not to come with reputation. You're not the boss. You're a servant. That, that you're just like everybody else, and if there's someone offended you, you've offended someone else. And uh, your obedience then is to be obedient unto the Lord. That is, should anything that that is not scriptural reason for separation be the means that you're going to separate or are you going to disobey God and separate because of your own pride? See, that, that's, that, that's what he's talking about in, in, this, in this passage. And, and the, the Lord Jesus Christ is the example of that. So uh, while we studied the Lord, and certainly I like to block everything else out while I study the Lord, it was said in the, in the sense of you applying that, and there's going to come a time that something's going to happen in your relationship, in your fellowship with the saints, that uh, you're going to be called on by God to practice this passage of Scripture. If there is consolation, if there's fellowship in the Spirit, then, then fulfill you my joy, Paul says, that you be like-minded and have that mind of Christ and get along even, even in, in light of offenses that might come your way. Now, with that, we move on past that. Because as we studied the Lord stooping down to become our Savior, it, we, it reads in verse 9, Wherefore, because he did that, God also hath highly exalted him, and hath given him a name above every name. Like I said, we're not going to list the seven steps. We'll save that for another time because we won't get past verse 9 today. First, the first thing we need to realize is that when, when we studied verses 6 through 8 there, where the Lord Jesus Christ condescended, he did that himself. He chose to do that. That was an act of his will. But the exaltation was not a self-act. The exaltation came from God the Father. Verse 9, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him this name that's above every name. Uh, or given him, uh, highly exalted him, given a name above, yes, above every name. Um, so that when we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, he humbled himself, but the exaltation came from God. Think about, as we studied already, Satan and his rebellion, because certainly he had the opposite mindset of Jesus Christ. Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. There's the five I wills of Isaiah chapter 14. I will exalt my throne. I will set my, I will, uh, uh, sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend into the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So everything, Satan's 
rather than condescending, he had, he had self-exaltation, did he not? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He didn't look for God's exaltation. He, didn't, he wasn't someone who was obedient to God and therefore rewarded of God to an exalted position. Satan was a person who didn't condescend at all, took his position and wanted to exalt himself. The very opposite of that. And, and come over to Matthew chapter 23. We want to always understand that we, do, we should never even exalt ourselves. That, ex, that being exalted is something that the Lord does. In, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 12, it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So it's up to the Lord to reward. It's up to the Lord to exalt. Our job is to stay humble and humble ourselves, and, and Satan did the opposite of that. Uh, Jesus Christ, he did humble himself, and it's God who highly exalted him. When you say, when you read that verse, and we un understand this is in the kingdom program and the warning about the kingdom, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Peter says in 1 Peter that in light of the tribulation that's going to be coming and the things that people will suffer in that tribulation, rather than claiming rights and, you know, keeping your possessions, you're going to be, people will be losing all those things. And Peter says, humble yourselves uh, under the mighty hand of God and he shall exalt you in due time. So during that tribulation when things are being stripped from people, accept it. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he shall exalt you in due time. Now that's in the kingdom program, but I think of some things that the Apostle Paul has said to us. In Galatians, where he starts talking about being, he's surprised that they're so soon removed from the gospel of grace. And he gives that warning that though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than we have preached, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I said, not now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. And then Paul says, now, do I serve man or God? Do I seek to please man or God? If I should seek to please man, I'm no more the servant of Christ. So, I mean, you, you can get exalted by men. If you, ex if you want self-exaltation, just please man. They'll give it to you. But if you seek to honor the Lord, you won't get the exaltation of men. But there's coming an exaltation from God someday. There is a reward someday. And just like Jesus Christ, the mind of Christ is a mind that we ought to have now among each other, keeping the understanding in our minds that that obedience to God, he's going to honor someday. And there is an exaltation, and it's up to him to exalt us, not to us exalt ourselves. And our job is just to be humble and obedient to him, and then leave it to him. And we know that 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That those who have rightly divided the word of truth, we won't be ashamed. We will stand before God. And God will honor faithful service to him and to his word, rightly divided. We know that Paul says in, in 2 Timothy, he, he so understood and, and we're going to be studying the judgment seat of Christ uh, in our conference, so this will be interesting. But I, the first time someone made it clear to me that the Apostle Paul knew that when he died, he says, henceforth there's a crown laid up for me. That the Apostle Paul wasn't waiting to the judgment seat of Christ before he realized how he's going to fare before God. I thought, wow. Because... <laughs> We just had a conversation in the fellowship hall and said, do you ever think of what it's like to meet God? And I have to admit, I'm just scared to death. <laughs> but you know, take a verse like that, and Paul wasn't scared to death. Paul, could un he knew what God wanted because he studied the word and taught what God taught. He run a race, he fought the good fight, he's kept the faith, henceforth there's a crown laid up for me. And, and so you can know what the Lord wants out of you and your obedience is going to be rewarded someday. So we also see that in, in, the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that exaltation comes from the Lord. Look, look, there's two passages of scripture when I was thinking about these things and looking at passages that I thought these are interesting. 
uh, among all the others, there are several, but come to Psalm 75. Even earlier when I was thinking, okay, um, what should I cut out of the message? Because there's always more verses to look at than we can look at. I couldn't get myself, I, I thought I was going to cut these out. And then I read them again and said, no, you can't cut these out. <laughs> look at this passage of scripture. Psalm 75, and just the whole psalm, there's only, what, ten verses to it. It says, Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declared. Now this actually is a kingdom psalm when it says thy, thy, thy name is near. What do you mean his name's near? Well, he's on his way. He's coming. The Lord is going to return and establish his kingdom. This is uh, the promise in the Old Testament to Israel. He says, when I shall, when I shall receive the, the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it, Selah. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. To the wicked, lift not up the horn. Now the horn speaks about exaltation. It talks about, it, 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 you can see here it's a horn of pride. It's used in the Bible many times of a ruler. It's referred to as a horn. You'll see it in this passage as a horn of the Lord. So that horn actually would be someone who's, you know, comes with reputation, come with uh, 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 high uh, uh, exaltation. So he's telling the wicked not to lift up the horn because God's going to judge when he comes back. Lift not up your horn on high, speak not with stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God judgeth, is judge. Isn't that interesting? There's one direction left out there, isn't there? That is really interesting. Because the second coming of Jesus Christ, he's coming from the north. When he comes, don't look all the other ways. You can look to Babylon where the Antichrist kingdom is going to be established. And he's going to try to move it to Jerusalem. And there's going to be the armies of the west uh, that are going to come. Well, the armies from the east that are going to cross Euphrates. But the, uh, the ships of Shittim are going to come and all that. Don't be looking to all the people of the earth for your exaltation. Your, your judge is coming from the north. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come. But God is judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. See, he's the, there's where exaltation comes. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red. It is full of mixture, and he poureth out the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praise to, to the God of Jacob, all the horns of the wicked and also, also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. There's exaltation coming from the Lord. And that's where you want to make sure that in your life, you just work on humbling yourself, you leave the exaltation to the Lord, and He'll, he'll, he'll reward obedience uh, to His word. Um, in, in another passage in the Old Testament, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And, and this is an interesting passage. It's actually the song of Hannah, is it? The, uh, it? She had already prayed, and she's praying to have the child Samuel. And the, Sam, and the child was born. God uh, uh, honored her prayer, gave her the child. She honored her, what she said she would do, and that is turn him over to the priesthood to be raised uh, to serve the Lord in the temple. And then this prayer of Hannah uh, is here in, second, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And it says... And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over the, mine enemy because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. For there, are, there is none besides thee. Neither is there any rock like our rock. Talk no more so, uh, so exceedingly proudly. Let the arrogancy come out, the arrogancy come out of, oh there we go, I knew it shouldn't come out. <laughs> Let not the arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord, that's a good, got to leave those knots in there. 
Every word is important. For the Lord uh, is God of... Ju- uh, now I can't read anything. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Why? That's enough just to think about right there and close the sermon, isn't it? Um, the bowels of the mighty are broken. They are stubble. Uh, 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 st- they that stumble are girded with strength. They that are full have hired themselves out for bread. They that are hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many, uh, many children is wax feeble. Everything just kind of the opposite when the Lord does things. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave. He bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and, make, and maketh rich. He bringeth low and, and lifteth up. He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifted the beggar from the dunghill. He set them among the princes to make them an inheritance, uh, make them to inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He has set set the the world upon them. Hannah had been put down by others because she couldn't have children. God honored her prayer. God exalted her. She sees God as the one who raised up the poor, that lifts up the beggar. He, 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 he sets them among the princes and makes them to inherit the throne of glory. Then, then the phrase, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. See, when it comes to the nation of Israel, it's all centered around the earth and what Jesus Christ is going to accomplish in the earth. You keep that in mind because we'll eventually get to Paul's epistles and God's purpose for the body of Christ and you'll see it's the exaltation of Jesus Christ into the heavens. But, but it goes on uh, to say, uh, uh, verse 9, it says, He will keep the feet of the saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by, by uh, strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces out of, out of the heavens shall the shall he thunder upon them the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth and he shall he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed so there's the exaltation coming again from God now in our study in Philippians Jesus Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God hath highly exalted him now, when, when Philippians says that wherefore God hath highly exalted him, the, the word highly, it means to be highly, means actually to be above all. Uh, there's another passage in Luke that I want to show you, so let me show you the one. There's two in Luke. Go to Luke chapter 1. Just so that you appreciate a small word like highly. Well, you realize it's, it's big in the sense that it's, it's high, but when it says highly, it actually is expressing how high something is. For instance, in Luke chapter 1, when it talks about Mary, the angel said this in verse 28. It says, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. When she was highly favored, she was favored above all women. That's why it goes on to say that thou art blessed among women. Highly favored. God didn't choose others for his son to be born through, but it was Mary. He highly favored her. Jesus Christ, wherefore God highly exalted him. That is, above all. He exalted the Lord Jesus Christ above all. And you'll you'll see exactly how high that is in a moment. But come over to Luke 16. Here's that other verse I want you to think about. It's kind of the negative thought. And I th- this verse, I think, is, is important when you live in the world and remember what the Apostle Paul, if I please man, then I'm not the servant of God. And when you please men, things are different in the sight of the people of this world. And the Lord gives a warning about that. In Luke 16 and verse 15, it says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is, a, is abomination in the sight of God. Now, you know, you, you think about that because the, the people, especially religious people, that are highly exalted above men, don't you get caught up with the crowd. 
Because if they're, did I not give the right verse? That was Luke 16, verse 15. Anyhow, the, the, you see the, uh, the crowd praising some religious man that you realize as soon as you see that that this, uh, the world would not accept. Uh, Jesus Christ wasn't highly esteemed among men, was he? It took the, took the women and the children and the sinners to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. Those that were of authority, they're the ones who rejected Jesus Christ. So it would be today that someone who would actually live for and speak for Jesus Christ isn't going to be highly exalted among men. And those who are, you can understand, they're an abomination to God. The world will never understand when you, when you think that way. You've got to be careful what you say to the religious world that exalts all those religious men. But you yourself know that those things are an abomination to God. So, when Mary was highly exalted, she was exalted above all women. Wherefore God hath highly exalted Jesus Christ. He is highly exalted. I don't use Greek words, and I'm using this one just to have fun with it. Because when you look at the, that word highly exalted in Philippians, it's only found in the New Testament in that passage. And it's pronounced something like, Hooper upso. But we, the reason I say that is we actually get the idea of hyper. It's used there in Philippians because what it's saying is that Jesus Christ was hyper exalted. That's why, that's why highly exalted. He is above all. He is hyper exalted. And, you know, they call us hyper dispensationalists. And that's not too bad of a term because we're going to get pretty hyper here in just a moment. Um, <laughs> But, the, but, but it's hyper around Jesus Christ. He's the one that's hyper exalted. Because when, when, it talk, when you talk about the exaltation of Jesus Christ, there is three degrees of, exalt, of highly exalting Jesus Christ. Come first to Acts chapter 1. Watch these three degrees. Most people only see two. But that's because they don't rightly divide the word of truth. Acts chapter 1. Jesus became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. The first degree of exaltation is certainly that God raised him from the dead. And, not, and, and throw in with number one degree there, not only raised from the dead, but ascended back into heaven. So, you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The former treatise, have I made thee, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So he, he ministered here on earth, and then he was raised from the dead and taken up. That taken up is explained as it happened in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. It says, And when he had spoken these things, while he, they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which, said un, which, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, that word heaven, they're standing there. The heaven they can see is the, the first. There's three heavens in your Bible. The atmosphere where the clouds are, he was received up into a cloud. So that they're looking in the, the heavens that are above the earth, the heaven above the earth. Then there's the heavens where the planetary system are, where God put the stars and the moon and the sun. That's in the second heavens. And then there's the throne room of God, which is the third heaven. These guys are looking into the heaven that you look up at and see Jesus Christ disappear into heaven. That's, that's where they're looking and they're seeing him go. So the first degree of exaltation of Jesus Christ is resurrection from the dead and then 40 days later ascends up into heaven. But he didn't just ascend up into heaven, Acts chapter 2. When he went into heaven, he was seated at the right hand of God. Now, Acts chapter 2, there, there's... Peter is talking about Jesus Christ, who they crucified and God raised from the dead. Uh, verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, that it, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. 
Then he starts referring to David who said, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither shall so the, the, suffer the Holy One to see corruption. And his point is, is David's flesh <laughs> is there in a grave. David was not speaking of himself. David was a prophet speaking about Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that, uh, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, not David, but of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Jesus Christ is of the seed of David. And of the fruit of David's loins, the great king of Israel, a descendant has come to be raised up to sit on his throne. Sometimes you read in your Bible how God raised him again. And we've been talking about that in the book of Acts because someone one time said, you know, Jesus Christ must have died twice because he was raised again. Well, he was raised up in birth, but then he was raised again from the dead so that he could sit on the throne of David. That's because you're talking about the resurrection here of Jesus Christ. But he's resurrected to sit on the throne of David. Verse 31, it says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. He's exalted to the right hand of God. And having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this. The Holy Spirit's been poured out because Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father poured out the Holy Spirit on the believing remnant. And they're speaking in tongues. And Peter's saying, this is what's happening. That's why you see this happening. This is what you see and hear. For David is not ascended into, notice that phrase, the heavens. But he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, now, so he's there until his enemies are going to be crushed under his feet. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, don't, no, no mistake about it here, that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's coming back in the day of the Lord to destroy his enemies and put down all that's high and lifted up. He's going to put them under his feet. He's coming back as Christ because to those who believe Jesus is the Christ, he's their Messiah, he's their Savior, he's their King, he's coming to reign over them. He's telling the nation of Israel, God has made him Lord and Christ. Which one are you going to know him as? Now even when you know him as Christ, he's still Lord. But those who, only, who will not acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, they're only going to know him as Lord. So you can see how that fits what we're studying over there in Philippians. But my point in reading to you, that first God exalts him, he raised him from the dead because, sin, because he was sinless. And because he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And exalted into the heavens. But not just into the heavens. When he got into the heavens, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now, the right hand of God can be a place in heaven, but when you read that in your Bible, the right hand of God is actually an expression that re refers to uh, a place of authority, a place of power. Uh, let me just read the verse to you. Hold your, just stay right there, because you'll recall this verse when I read it. Jesus Christ, when <laughs> the enemies were ready to have him crucified, were, were questioning him to try to find something against him, Wait a minute, let me double check that. Yeah, it is that. Okay. Jesus, here's one of the last things Jesus Christ said unto them when they're questioning him. He says, he said unto them, uh, it's Matthew 26, verse 64, just listen. Jesus said unto them, thou hast said, they asked him if he's the Christ, thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So again, they're going to see him in the clouds of heaven. They're going to see him come back into the earth's atmosphere, aren't they? So when they said, are you the Christ? He said, you've said it. Now you're going to crucify me right now, but the next time you see me, 
I'm going to be coming back. But because he's going to sit down at the right hand of power. So when you talk about the right hand of God, you're not necessarily talking about a place, although there, there is certainly a place there. But you're talking about the, the authority that's going to be given unto him. When he rose from the dead, he said, All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He said, Therefore go preach. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand to the apostles. So the Lord Jesus Christ was exalted to a place of power at the right hand of the Father. We just read in the book of Acts that, he, that the Lord told him to sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. So come over to Acts chapter 7. Now here's the last message to the nation of Israel in Jerusalem. Peter, uh, Stephen, indicting not just the, uh, the Greek-speaking Jews that are gathered there, and, and he begins to speak about Jesus Christ and how they've been given another chance, and now they've blown that other chance in rejecting him, and they begin to stone him to death. They're gnashing on him with their teeth. They're going to stone him to death. In verse 55, we read this. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. Now, what heaven is he looking into? Well, he's looking up, so he's looking into heaven. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. You're going to sit until I make your enemies your footstool. Here's a bunch of people who decide to be enemies of Jesus Christ and kill his spokesman, Stephen. Stephen says, I see heaven open and Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God. Well, that means he's going to come back and judge them, doesn't it? Verse 56 says, and he said, now he's going to tell them what he just saw, because they don't see it. Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And this is where they block their ears, they don't want to hear it, and they go ahead and kill him. And in the process of doing that, the one in authority here is a man named Saul who became Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, two chapters from now. God, rather than Jesus Christ coming back in wrath, when, he, when Stephen sees him standing, God did something else that the prophets didn't say would happen. Rather than sending wrath, God saved Saul of Tarsus, made him Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, to tell him about the riches of, our, of his grace through the cross of Christ. And that God is long-suffering, as Peter said it, not willing, to, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God opened up another ap opportunity for all men to be saved, and to be saved by His grace through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. To preach the preaching of the cross. But, but you saw, notice that phrase in verse 56, I, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened. Well, you know, later when you read about the, about the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, you, you'll see Jesus Christ again stand again in Revelation chapter 5. An interesting thing takes place. Revelation 5, they're seeing this scroll in the hand of God who's sitting on the throne. In his, it's in his right hand. And then no one has the right to open the book and see what's in it until Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, comes and takes it out of the right hand of the Father and opens it up and we call it the title deed to the earth because it's the beginning of his judgment where Jesus Christ is going to come back and reign on this earth. You see Jesus, in that chapter, Jesus Christ standing, taking that scroll. So he is going to stand and return and judge. And, and, and you see that taking place in the heavens as you see that in, in the book of Revelation. So all that is going to be fulfilled. In the meantime, something else has happened. Jesus is still at the right hand of the Father. But when I say that he was hyper-exalted. Come over with me to Ephesians chapter 1. When, he, when Philippians says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. When you get highly exalted, exalted above all, you have in the book of Ephesians, God's purpose for you and I as members of the body of Christ, what we're going to share in with Jesus Christ. That's why verse 19 talks about God's power to usward. But then talks about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ, what God has done with Jesus Christ that you and I are a part of and going to share in. But let's focus in on Jesus Christ, verse 20, for Ephesians 1, verse 20. 
which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. See, when God raised Jesus Christ, three degrees. Raised him from the dead, ascended into heaven. Second degree, sat him at his own right hand in the heavens. But over here you're reading about Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God, far above all principalities and powers. Now we're talking about not just at the right hand of God above the earth, but the right hand of God above all the heavens. That's why it says far above. There's your hyper <laughs> exaltation of Christ. And it goes on to say, and hath put all things under his feet. Now that's just not all things under the, in the earth, that's all things in the heavens as well. And gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We're part of Jesus Christ being glorified in heaven and earth. But our part's the heavens. So that when Paul talks about Jesus Christ's exaltation, that exaltation and our relationship to Christ in that exaltation is called far above all heavens. Well, look over in chapter 4 of Ephesians. Now this one, this is homework for you to go and think about in more depth. The passage itself causes you to question all kinds of different statements. But probably the one you don't question is the one that you need to concentrate on. See, in chapter 4 it's about us now walking worthy of our vocation. And he made a statement in verse 7. It says, but to every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now we, we don't even want to talk about when God, Jesus Christ poured out gifts. But watch verse 8 and 9 real close. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led, captive, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So when we talk about the gifts to the body of Christ, Verse 8 says, the gifts to the body of Christ came when he ascended up on high. Not just that he ascended, but he ascended up on high. Now we're going to talk about that ascending up on high, but from the, 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 the word when in verse 8 needs to be noted. Because he didn't give gifts to the body of Christ when he ascended into the heavens and sat at the right hand of the Father. He poured out the Holy Spirit and gave gifts to the twelve apostles. There was no body of Christ. When did he give gifts to the body of Christ? If you'll notice the gifts that he gave, verse 11, he gave some apostles and some prophets. Notice that order. That's to the body of Christ. Israel's program, they first had prophets, then they had apostles. In the body of Christ, we have apostles first, secondarily, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14, prophets. So we're talking about ministry, gifts to the body of Christ came when Jesus Christ ascended on, up on high. Well, remember, he ascended into the heavens, plural, and then sat at the right hand of God until his enemies were made his footstool. Then he stood up. Did he just sit down right where he was? Or when, after he stood up, did God at that point highly exalt Jesus Christ another degree above that? Now he's far above all heavens. Watch this, verse 9. Now you want to talk about the one about leading captivity captive. Get that out of your mind right now. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? That's how, that, that, isn't that what we're studying in Philippians? His condensation? And then God ex highly exalted him, right? Verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. That's higher than what you're reading about in the book of Acts. And when he, it's when he ascended up on high, far above all heavens, that he called out the apostle Paul and made him Paul the apostle to the Gentiles and gave gifts to the body of Christ to start forming the body of Christ of which you and I are a part of today. The Lord Jesus Christ, just, just to get started in our study of the book of Philippians. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. Understand how high Jesus Christ has been exalted. Not just Lord of the, of the earth, not just according to Israel's program, but God highly exalted Jesus Christ and exalted him far, far above all heavens. There he's at the right hand of God 
for you and me as we're going to share in his reign of the heavens, exalted above all, and Jesus Christ is highly exalted. We'll, you'll see that more and more as we look at the, at the seven steps of exaltation in the book of Philippians. It's a real privilege to know that Jesus Christ not only died and paid for our sins so that we could be saved by grace, look what else you get by grace. I don't, I don't care what degree of exaltation you have as a reward, just being there in the heavens with Jesus Christ, seated with Christ in heavenly places, what grace God has bestowed upon us. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for these truths. We pray that we look at those verses closely and realize that Jesus Christ has indeed been highly exalted. And Father, we thank you that we have a place in that exaltation of Jesus Christ sharing in his glory in eternity future, serving him in a place of, uh, that honors him, that fills him into the universe, all to the praise of your glory. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. If you'd turn please to number 90 one more time, we'll just stand and sing the chorus, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The cross leads home. You are dismissed. Happy Labor Day.